let's let's do Hess, let's do a Hess's law example, and then we're gonna call it good for today, and we'll finish up thermochemistry tomorrow. Um, Hess's law. So before we get to anything that's there on the slide, let me tell you that Hess's law problems at the end of the day, if you're good with math and if you can think of them kind of as a Tetris problem, you're set. You'll be able to just brute force math your way through solving these. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to answer any concept questions about them, but if it comes to a math problem, you'll be able to get it. This is one of those situations where your math skills will easily allow you to get a B um, in the course and with respect to Hess's Law. The A is going to require math skills and concept understanding. If you're not good at the math part of these, you're going to need to practice these because these are indeed math heavy kinds of uh, situations. Okay, so Hess's Law. Enthalpy change is a state function because it's a state function. It doesn't really care how it gets from point A to point B. It just cares that it gets there. So it could stop at C, D, E, F, G along the way. It doesn't care. It just matters what point A was, what point B was. That's going to be the like crux scientifically uh, behind Hess's law. So Hess's law is going to be uh, is going to be something that we're going to use to figure out what the enthalpy change is for a complicated chemical reaction um, if we can't easily measure the change in enthalpy other ways for said chemical reaction before we dive in on a problem there's a couple of things that I'd like you to remember about Hess's law problems one if we reverse a reaction that is to say, if we take the products and we make them reactants and reactants and turn them into products, so we reverse the direction of a reaction, we need to change the sign on whatever the enthalpy of that reaction was. So if we change the direction of the reaction, which is legal, we also have to change the sign. We have to flip the sign of whatever delta H was. The magnitude of delta H is going to be directly proportional to the quantities of our reactants and products in our reaction. Translation. If we end up needing to multiply a chemical reaction, an entire reaction, both the products and the reactants, by some multiple, maybe the number two, because in order for the problem to work, we need double the amount of reactants and double the amount of products. That's legal. Absolutely legal. But what we have to do is also multiply the enthalpy uh, value for that reaction by two, or whatever coefficient it was that we multiplied um, our reactants and products by. So whatever the multi whatever if we do end up having to double the reaction, triple the reaction, we're going to have to double or triple the enthalpy of reaction numeric value as well. Okay, so that was a lot of words that probably didn't make a ton of sense. We're going to try to use this problem here to talk through it. Okay, this is a pretty standard fair Hess's Law kind of problem. So it says, given the following data, uh, and it's going to give you a bunch of equations, um, and it's going to give you a bunch of enthalpies of reaction, it will ask you something along the lines of, Calculate delta H for this reaction. Cool. What I would try to orient you to is the stuff at the top has components, like those three equations up at the top there. They have components, uh, and either they're reactants or their products, that match up to components here in the bottom reaction. So, for example, reaction, the top one, the chlorine fluoride, monochlorine monofluoride uh, reactant is going to be seen in the reaction of interest. It's up there and it's down at the bottom. They are, the, C, the CLF is going to be a reactant for both 
that top equation and the bottom equation. There's a relationship there. But in that top equation, there's oxygen. And there's no oxygen in the equation of interest. So what we need to do is figure out some way of mixing and matching the three equations that are given to us up top such that when we combine them, things that we're not interested in, like that oxygen, cancel out. And all we're left with is the products and the reactants that we see in that final reaction at the bottom, the uh, one of interest. Okay, let's try to make that make a little bit more sense. So if we take a look, see, and I'm going to, um, the way that I typically approach these kinds of problems is um, even if the thing is written out, like the question is written out with the data like that, I end up usually rewriting them out on a piece of paper so that I can scratch them up uh, and make marks and notations to myself um, so without messing up the original problem. So 2CLF, one thing that uh, I like to do is so that I don't have to write out a bazillion things, I look at the entire problem and I identify what phase things are in. So right now, every single substance is in the gas phase. That's awesome because every single substance is in the gas phase for my chicken scratch I'm going to omit writing out the gas phase after every single one of the chemicals. In the case though, where we have something like water, water sometimes shows up as a gas and as a liquid in these kinds of problems. You need to keep track of the phase if there are multi phases with these kinds of problems. So maybe in one equation, water is a gas, and in another equation, it's a liquid, and maybe in one equation, it's a gas and a liquid. At that point in time, I strongly can strongly urge you to write out the phases. But here, everything's a gas. I'm omitting them. So we've got our top equation then. Going to form our wonderful species. Oops there, that's a terrible plus. There we go. And for right now, for simplicity's sake, I'm not going to write out those enthalpies of formation. And then 2ClF3 plus 2O2 going to form Cl2O plus 3F2 and then F2, oops, 2F2 two plus O2 going to form F2O. Great. Yahtzee. Oops, I forgot a 2. There's a stoichiometric coefficient there that I didn't write. And if you don't get the stoichiometric coefficients in there, you are going to have a really bad time trying to get these things to all work. Okay, so we double check, we make sure that the stoichiometric coefficients are written in there correctly, and make sure that all of our products and our reactants are written out properly. I think we are good. Okay, let's start identifying ways to solve this. So we want things that are our reactants to be on the reactant side and things that are products to be on the product side. So let's do a little bit of color coding. Um, specifically, our final problem once the CLF, that uh, monochlorine monofluoride to be a reactant. If I go to the three equations that I've got written out here, I see that first reaction has that CLF. And if I look through the other reactions that I've got written out, I don't see any other uh, of that chemical anywhere. If I'm looking for my fluorine now, I'm going to change highlighter color. The only place I see fluorine is in the third equation. And conveniently in that third equation, it, the fluorine is also a reactant. So hey, we're 
fat in a thousand here. That's pretty great. Now my product for my final equation needs to be the monochlorine trifluoride. And if I look up in the three equations I've gotten written out, there's only one place I see the chlorine trifluoride or the monochlorine trifluoride, and that's the second equation. The bummer here is that the second equation has it written out as a reactant. No big deal for us, because what we can do is we can say, we need to reverse that one. So using the magic of iPad, I'm gonna move that equation down there because I didn't give myself a ton of room. I'm now going to re reverse that second equation. I'm gonna write out Cl2O plus 3F2O going to form Clf three and two oxygens. Now remember how I didn't write out delta H before? Now I need to write myself some kind of note here because I reversed the second reaction. I need to reverse the sign for delta H. And I need to remember that when I'm going to do my final math here. Okay. So now I've got, I'm going to just for our sake here to try to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm going to put a line through that second equation the way it was originally written. Not so much because it's dead to us, but because we're not going to use it in that form. We're going to use it in the form that we have rewritten it as. Okay. Here's where we can start having a little bit of fun. We can say, what happens if we add all of these three equations together? What's that look like? Well, it means that we're gonna take the reactants of every single one of our three equations and put them on the reactant side of one big mastery equation. And we're gonna put the products on all three equations on the product side of one equation. So it's gonna look a little something like this. So the two Cl, oops, Cl, F2 plus O2, and then plus Cl2O plus, 3F2O plus 2F2 plus O2. And that's everything that was a reactant. And because this is really long and my writing is kind of big, I'm going to just shift the products down a line but I'm gonna still put the arrow there to say hey, it's gonna to go to form and I'm gonna put now all of my products. Um, so we go Cl2O plus F2O plus ClF3 plus 2O2 plus 2F2O. And we need to make sure that we've got all of our stuff actually accounted for and written out. Um, so we had one, two, three, four, five total things on our product side. We have one, two, three, four, five things on our product side. So five from the uh, three equations up top. So we have five here in the equations down the bottom. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six on our reactants. One, two, three, four, five, six on our reactants. Looks like we're doing good. Mm, almost done, maybe. Now it's time to check in to see, do we have anything that's on the reactant side and anything that's on the product side in the exact same form, in the exact same phase? So for example, um, if we take a look, see at the oxygens. On the reactant side, we have an oxygen here and we have an oxygen here. So we have a total of two oxygens. On the product side, we have two oxygens. They can cancel then because it's showing up on the reactants 
and the products in the exact same form in the exact same phase it's almost like it's a spectator when we talked about spectator ions um, back in chapter four do we have anything else that we can cancel out so if we go here um, we have our uh, Cl2O as a reactant we have it as a product easy breezy we can cancel that out okay anything else we can cancel we've got one two three F2O as our products we have three F2O as reactants so that means that those can all get canceled out. And if we clean this up now a little bit, the things that we're left with are something like that. looking right did, did you write something on the oh are board? you guys not seeing that mm -mm. oh good I did why is that not updating all right stand by riveting live television okay do you see the updated now? So what we've got here, as I wrote this stuff out, like that. We're almost done, folks, promise. Okay, so this equation should be, if I had the right slide deck up, the exact same as the equation uh, that we see as part of the PowerPoints. And in fact, here's what this should have been. Sweet. And present. Okay, great. That's how that equation, so if you're looking on the video, the equation should have been asking you for this. The key difference is that the first time I had it displayed, the uh, final equation didn't have the coefficient of two in front of either the fluorine or the um, chlorine difluoride. But now the question is actually asking you the right thing. The work that we did gave us that reaction The question is asking for delta H. This is where we would write out that delta H stuff and we take into consideration what we did to equation one, two, and three up here at the top. So equation one, we did nothing to it. It stayed the same. We didn't reverse it. We didn't have to multiply it or do anything. So that means that delta H for it is gonna look exactly like what is given to us in the problem. Equation two, we wrote ourselves a note that we reversed the sign. So now that means for delta H, we need to reverse the sign. So now instead of being 341, it's going to be a negative 341.4 kilojoules. For the third equation, we did nothing to it. So delta H will still be the negative 43.4 kilojoules. We added all three equations up above to get our final equation that we wrote out below. So that means we're going to add all three of our delta H values that we have written out here. So mathematically, we should end up with 167.4 minus 341.4 four 
minus 43.4, negative 317.4 kilojoules. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our final answer. So the Tetris part of this that I was talking about really is sometimes you have to flip and multiply the pieces just to make everything fit and to get stuff to cancel out. This is like a chemical Sudoku logic problem though. You really can just kind of uh, lean on your math ability to get these right. You can just say, how do I make the left and the right have stuff that cancels out so that I get the final reaction that I'm looking for. And you can just keep flipping pieces around and keep trying different combinations until you get it there. Your discussion packet has a more complicated uh, version of one of these problems. And your book has plenty of practice problems too.